Good morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, our webinar. Uh, on behalf of Leap for FNSA project, I'd like to welcome you all. Um, I'm Nurhane Dalel, project manager um, at the Egypt EU Cooperation Unit at the Ministry of Higher Education and Scientific Research in Egypt. Um, and I would like to thank you all for joining us today for this very interesting webinar. And I would like to thank our speakers as well for giving us this opportunity uh, to share with us their experiences. Today's event is under the title of Synergies Between R&I, Entrepreneurship and Industry with Funders in the Food and Agriculture Sector. So just let me briefly introduce the Leap for FNSA project if you haven't um, attended any previous events that we have organized. Uh, it's a coordination and support action funded under the H2020 um, uh, EU fund. Um, the aim of the project is to establish a sustainable platform for the efficient and coherent implementation of the AU-EU Research and Innovation Partnership. And uh, we would like to um, promote Leap for FNSSA as an enabler and a catalyzer for the transformation of the FNSSA partnership into a bicontinental platform. The main actions is to support the Bureau of the AU-EU-HLPD, create strategic alliances, strengthen the knowledge base, and facilitate the research and innovation networks. We have 35 partners from 23 countries, 20 partners from Europe, and 15 um, countries uh, in Africa. Uh, we have France, Netherlands, Ghana, Germany, Finland, Czech Republic, South Africa, Denmark, Egypt, Nigeria, Hungary, Ethiopia, Spain, Sweden, Uganda, Kenya, Italy, Burkina Faso, Senegal, Austria, Greece, UK, and Portugal. So as you see, it's a huge network of actors that are really working together towards creating this platform. Uh, this, this webinar is um, the fourth webinar in a series of webinars that we held earlier, starting in 2019, focusing on policy making and empowering the community and economic growth. And today we're talking about promoting the network between R&I, entrepreneurship, industry, and funders in the food and agriculture sector. So the discussion today will revolve around how a sustainable transformation requires the involvement of all stakeholders, uh, an inclusive array of private sector actors, and um, mobilizing public and private investments to drive food system transformation, and the benefits that agriculture R&I is linked to industry and farmers and the role, it, the role it plays in the economic development of the region. We have our speakers today, uh, Mr. Kayan Jeff, Senior Partnership and Resource Mobilization Officer at FAO. We have Mr. Olaf Kirvin, its Senior Director of Strategy and a Key Leader in the Good Food Finance. We have Nono Sekoto, Sector Lead Agribusiness, AL for Agribusiness in Africa. I will just walk you through the agenda quickly. Um, we will have now the first session, uh, the strategy for private sector engagement by Mr. Kayan Jeff. Afterwards, the Good Food Finance Initiative and the Food Systems Game Changers Lab by Olav Kirvin and uh, supporting agripreneurs to build innovative ventures by Nono Sekoto. Afterwards, we will have a final session for open discussion. Also, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A tab. Uh, in order uh, to be easy for us to follow the questions, you can use the chat, but we prefer the Q&A tab. Now I would like to give the floor to Mr. Kayan Jaff for his first presentation, the strategy for private sector engagement. Mr. Kayan is a national of the USA. He holds a master's of science degree in development economics from North Carolina State University and a bachelor's of science degree in agriculture and resource economics from Oregon State University. He's currently the Senior Partnership and Resource Mobilization Advisor at FAO's Regional Office for the Near, Near East and North Africa region. And throughout the past 20 years, he has served at FAO's headquarters in Rome, the regional offices, sub-regional offices, and country offices. Um, at, the, at the headquarters, he was the advisor in the Office of Decentralized Offices and Units for Private Sector and Non-State Actors is also economist and investment center funded under the World Bank's cooperative program. And he was the representative in the UAE from 2005, 2011 and senior policy advisor in the regional office of Near East and North Africa, the deputy FAO representative in Sudan. And he was employed in the private sector as a managing director of a large multinational agribusiness. So I think he's the best to tell us exactly how the private sector could be 
engaged in such a process. Thank you, Mr. Kayan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Norhan, and good morning, good afternoon, everyone. It's really a pleasure for me to be here, and I'm really looking forward to uh, interacting with all of you. This is um, a, an excellent platform for all of us to, to, to engage, and I look forward to interacting with all of you. Um, first of all, allow me first to just give a little bit of a background about what FAO does with the private sector, and particularly in this region. Um, as, as many of you know, FAO is uh, over 75 years old, and uh, historically, we are basically government-driven because that's what we uh, accounted to the uh, uh, 195 member states. But more recently, in the last 10 years or so, we have been more and more prone to dealing with non-state actors. And when we say non-state actors, we mean um, um, all the way from academia to the private sector to uh, to the civil society and and uh, and the array of non-governmental organizations, small farmers, and so on and so forth. So, FAO decided in the last five years that we should really redesign our private sector energy and synergies and strategy. So this happened, um, as most of you know, FAO is uh, uh, accountable to its member states. So whatever we do in the sense of strategies, it has to be approved by the member states. And this happened uh, last summer um, under the COVID-19 circumstances. I know it wasn't very easy, but it certainly went through, uh, um, uh, let's say a quick motion of approvals. So, and of course, everything now is based and hubbed uh, around the sustainable development goals. So what we did was we engaged, uh, in order to do it right, we engaged with the private sector. They helped us. Now, when I say the private sector, now we are very cautious because the private sector, as we all know, can be multinationals, too small uh, a national or even local private sectors who are basically farmers, because a farmer at the end of the day is a private entity, and he's there to make sure that what he grows gives him a positive return. So this is the way that we did it, um, and and I'll try to walk you through it today very quickly because and I, and I'll be happy to also share my PowerPoint with all of you, and also Norhan, I'll be happy to share the actual FAO strategy with the with the private sector. So what, what we did once we got the approval to, um, to go ahead with the private sector strategy, we held in Cairo at the regional office, we held a virtual meeting with our stakeholders explaining to them what is the vision of the new uh, private sector strategy. And of course, uh, one of the things that we did was uh, um, is to share a common understanding of the challenges faced by the agri-food systems in the region. This is very important in engaging the private sector. You always ask yourself, what does the private sector want from an organization in the UN such as FAO and vice versa? So these are important elements that we took into account, how to obtain feedback on the four priorities that we are uh, dealing with in FAO and also identifying bottlenecks. This is very important and constraints so you can show better engagement with the private sector, again, in the agri-food um, systems that achieves the, the sustainable development goals and particular SDG2. So what we did was we started talking to the micro, small and medium-sized agri-food enterprises, including the startups. And we wanted to see from them how they can help us to play a critical role in achieving food uh, security and eradicating rural poverty with special emphasis on digital agriculture and youth and women-led businesses. I know I said a lot in that sentence, but these are, those are key areas that I know that all of us, even the um, my colleague uh, uh, speakers, I'm sure they will touch upon that. Then we have the large firms, which include larger national, multinational companies and state-owned. Those are also enterprises that we'd like to talk to so we can also push our agenda with them. Um, the other entity that we also look at are financial institutions. Financial institutions play a very important role. Let it be commercial banks, private investors, impact investors, and other private investment institutions. They are also the ones that we look at. Now, I will, I will, I will try to also show you now, that was my introduction, is to share with you a PowerPoint, which I have, and, and I think uh, hopefully um, we can uh, 
get a better idea of what's going on. I, I, I hope you can see the, the, the PowerPoint. So. Yes, yes. Thank you. This, the strategy was basically one that, um, as I said, was uh, there. What, what was the vision? We had to design what the vision is. And, and the vision was to show that we can engage with the private sector because FAO has its own mandate and it's very, it's very clear. Leave no one behind through sustainable, inclusive and resilient food systems. We, have, we call it the four Bs, better production, better nutrition, better environment and a better life. This is really the new logo of FAO within the new normal that we are in. Uh, we all know that the, under the circumstances that we are in, we are the largest UN agency, specialized agency within the UN. So our uh, stewardship is the SDG2, which is zero hunger, and of course, SDG1, which is eradicating poverty. So this is the mandate of FAO, and we wanted the private sector to know it very clearly in the, uh, up, up in the, up, uh, it, as soon as we engage with them. These are the principles of engaging with the private sector that we thought that we would put in front of them. What is the contribution to attaining the SDGs? The SDGs are basically our guidelines. And this was laid out. And, and, and if you like, I can, we can share with you the actual strategy itself. But this is, let's say, a quick summary. Then respecting the values of what the United Nations and FAO was built upon. These are also very important. We must never also show that there are any compromises. This is the point of the private sector. We always have this premonition that the private sector can have impartiality, uh, uh, you know, reputation risk. And, and, and there are many, many elements that the private sector may not see what we see. Um, also, how to manage uh, uh, avoiding any conflicts among each other. That was also raised. Um, demonstrating contributions to our mandate is also very important. As I said earlier in my uh, opening remarks, we always ask ourselves, what does the private sector want from us and what can we contribute to the private sector? These are very important. And if you can outline this in the beginning of your relationship with them, then I think there's a clarity that, that can come from it. Um, these are basically the pillars of what we are working on. And, and, and as I said, I'll be happy to share this PowerPoint with all of you. But basically, at the end of the day, it's uh, reducing risks. Uh, protecting the organization's mandate and making sure that the private sector can be a partner with us in eradicating hunger and bringing zero hunger to the most needy and vulnerable. Um, then, then, then we went into into the entities, uh, which which I mentioned earlier in my uh, in my introduction. Who are we addressing? You know, you have the farmers, as I said. At the end, we are here to help the farmers. Okay. And when I say a farmer, it could be one farmer or he could be a member of a farmer's organization. So th this is one. The second one are the cooperatives, which again comes under non-state actors. You have the producer organizations. These are also important. And as you see, we're climbing up from the one person to bigger and bigger. Then you have the larger firms, of course, the multinationals, the large uh, um, you know, state-owned companies, the parastatals. These are also an important value chain there and they're, they're in the food chain so they are important for us to know how to address and of course then you come to the industry the, the, all the trade associations the private consortiums and also the agribusiness um wh what we call unions you know th that are uh, certainly not just in the mil in in our region but i think globally um then you come to the what, what we call the smes they're also there Last but not least, I already touched upon the financial institutions are the philanthropic foundations. These are very eminent in our region. You have the Gulf states who are the oil producing nations. They have established, uh, let's say foundations that can be uh, you know, accessed. All of this that we're talking about because FAO is a technical agency, we're not a financial institution. So we always look for the financial support to, so we can carry out our mandate. And the private sector we see could be a very important partner. Now, um, this is maybe one pie chart that may give you a, um, a small idea of how FAO 
uh, deals with uh, the private sector. I want to say in the outset also that the European Union is our largest donor. Uh, the, the, this is something very important that we have to know. Uh, the European Union fin finances globally, I would say over 42% of all of our programs, and in particularly in the Near East and in Egypt also. So this gives you an idea about the engagement with the private sector, percentage by region and percentage by entities, which is what we talked about earlier. The IFIs, the international financial institutions, the multilaterals, the small, the micro, uh, and, and the medium-sized um, entities. As I said, this is just a quick, I don't know, I was told not to exceed my time so we can leave time to talk. So um, these are the priority areas that we also identified in the strategy. Again, it's very important that the private sector understands what are the organization's priorities because there's a process and there is, uh, um, let's say a mandate of the organization that has to be uh, met and fulfilled by our member states. So water, of course, is an issue in this region, for example. So we have to address the crisis of water. Um, facilitating uh, um, and helping small farmers is also a key area. Another one, of course, is resilience. Uh, unfortunately, we live in a, in a region that is very resilient based because of, uh, uh, of the political and, and, and the social structure uh, set up, unfortunately. So we have to address those. Capitalizing on data is also very important. Again, I've only touched upon the key areas that I thought maybe this webinar would benefit from. Um, the structure of the engagement uh, is also very important because the private sector looks at an organization like FAO of how can we benefit from them? Of course, the number one element that we always tell them is that look at us as an opportunity because the private sector at the end of the day looks at the bottom line. Is there a profit? in it for them. And that's what you have to understand as a non-governmental or an intergovernmental organization that we are not profit oriented. So, but we still have to think like them. So the idea is to benefit by putting on a private sector. Lucky for me, I came from the private sector. So I have the niche where I can think of being on one side versus the other one. So these are the other areas. And, and then, um, what we have done is we've created platforms and we thought these platforms with this day and age is very important that you have transparency. Um, unfortunately, sometimes with the UN, we're looked at as being a closed link of network where it's difficult for you to enter into the system to obtain data and so on. But I think that has changed and it's certainly changing on a day-to-day -day basis. So we have established what we call a connect portal that basically provides what FAO does and vis-a-vis -vis include private sector entities that are working with us. And I think this is very important. It gives them the confidence that they're partnering with us. It gives them the element of relationship that they have with an organization like FAO. And it gives us the, the, the opportunity when we design projects to include them with us. Um, I'm just going to share with you what we do in this region. And I think it's very important. I gave you the, the four betters on the other side of the organization, but this is what we are focusing on, the four priorities to transform the region's food systems. Uh, of course, transformation and inclusive value chains is very important. Food security, we always hear of food security and healthy diets is very important in this region. Uh, greening agriculture, uh, because it addresses water scarcity and water scarcity is the number one priority in this region. And last but not least, as I had mentioned earlier, building resilience to multiple shocks and the protracted prices and the development uh, and humanitarian nexus. Um, this is my last slide. Um, I wanted to share this with you to show you where, uh, where our accelerators are. And so we have the policies, which is what I do personally. I'm engaged in the policy design with governments and non-governmental institutions. Uh, the public-private investment is also very important. The evidence-based, we need to see the evidence of what we're trying to do. Innovation is, a, is the buzzword that we are hearing every day, and that's what we have to address. And last but not least, to me, also being a partnership advisor is partnership. And, and to harness the power of partnership is very, very important. And as you can see from this slide, this is a partnership between the League of Arab States and the EU. So on that note, 
thank you very, very much. I hope I have maintained my uh, timing. So Norhan, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kayan, for this very interesting presentation. And I think uh, the strategy itself is shared in the chat box now, if you would like to take a deeper look in it. Uh, please, if you have any questions, just again, use the Q&A tab. We will just collect all the questions and have a final discussion at the end. Uh, now, uh, please allow me to introduce our speaker, the next speaker, just So just moving forward from engaging the private sector to the uh, food system transformation by leveraging the power of finance and the system focused change agents. We have uh, Olaf Kervin, the senior director of strategy from EAT. Uh, he is part of EAT's leadership team and provides a, strate a strategic oversight to EAT's policy work. He leads the engagement on global policy arenas and guides EAT's science and knowledge initiatives for maximum impact on food systems, policies, and practices. Uh, his career spans political leadership roles for Norwegian Development Cooperation and several senior leadership posts at the UN. He led the Bureau for Development Policy of the United Nations Development Program for almost seven years and uh, overseeing an international staff of more than 360 programs delivering in hundreds of millions every year and policy work ranging from democratic governance to climate change and he also played the central role in the complex and highly political process that led to the agenda 2030 and the sdgs in 2015 we're very happy to have you today olive and the floor is yours please share your screen thank you uh, very much uh, norhan and thank you so much for this uh, opportunity to take part in this uh, very interesting uh, webinar. It really is an, is an honor. So uh, I will share my screen. Um, just make sure I show you the right one. Um, Uh, are you able to see my uh, my my slides? Yes. Excellent. So um, I will be uh, talking to you about uh, two uh, initiatives that may seemingly seem um, uh, very different um, uh, and distinct, um, but uh, I hope you will realize uh, that they are in fact uh, very very interlinked and um, and uh, can be mutually uh, supportive. One uh, deals with the challenge of uh, aligning uh, food finance uh, with uh, what needs to happen in coming years when it comes to transforming our food systems. And uh, it's, uh, it's a bit top down in nature, um, while the other one is uh, uh, more bottom up oriented. It's about really empowering uh, change makers uh, around the world uh, with ideas uh, that can help us transform our food systems. Um, and that, of course, um, in order for that to happen, uh, finance have to, has to flow in the direction of these kinds of change makers. I'll start with the Food Systems Summit and some key takeaways from uh, from our perspective of the summit, which took place on September 23rd, uh, just a few weeks ago. Um, I, I think the summit has really helped to broaden the understanding around the world that it really is uh, urgent to uh, transform our food systems to deliver better for people and planet. It's about eliminating hunger. It's about uh, transforming production to become more regenerative or, or nature positive. Um, while, of course, uh, ensuring food security and, uh, and sufficient uh, quantities of, uh, of a healthy and nutritious food for everyone. It's about shifting consumption patterns and um, about securing equitable livelihoods for producers. And of course, in all of this, building uh, resilient uh, food systems. And we've seen 
that the political realization of the importance of this agenda is spreading. There are now more than 100 countries that have embarked on so-called national pathways to sustainable food systems by 2030. And that is a truly significant uh, game-changing development in and of uh, itself. Many of those countries are in Africa, of course. And we've seen a vast mobilization of people with game-changing ideas that have put their solutions forward through the five action tracks that were set up uh, in preparation of the summit. Um, uh, what is, is, is really emerging is uh, that uh, it's more broadly understood that uh, we need a systems mindset. Uh, we need to think and act uh, across several sectors if we want our food systems to deliver better. And also that finance is a key lever of change um, uh, if you want to see uh, real transformative change uh, going forward. Um, now, uh, turning to uh, food finance, uh, what is the problem here? Uh, well, um, first and foremost, that uh, the way finance currently flows into uh, our food systems, it's uh, upholding and maintaining uh, the status quo. Uh, and that is happening at increasing, uh, an, uh, increasing risk to uh, our climate, uh, to our societies and to uh, people uh, everywhere. Uh, whether we think uh, about it in terms of uh, um, the, the hunger issue, you know, with hunger numbers again increasing, including in, in Africa, uh, whether we think about it in terms of diet-related illness, which uh, is exploding on the scene uh, all over the world with uh, uh, rising numbers of obese people um, uh, with uh, um, diabetes and other diet-related uh, illnesses, very much uh, due to uh, uh, the overarching trends in consumption that we are seeing around the world. Um, we also see that um, uh, the, the, the planetary uh, challenges are growing. Uh, food systems are a major contributor to climate change, uh, the main driver of loss of nature and biological diversity. Uh, and, um, um, and and we already heard a lot uh, in the previous presentation about the water issues uh, that are also uh, acute in many places, including in large parts of Africa. Um, now, finance actors uh, across public and private sectors around the world are generally not engaged in the conversation about uh, the future of food. And that needs to change. There is too little focus on uh, innovating finance solutions, um, uh, uh, which we need in order to drive change. And there's little support for change makers on the ground, as I'm sure many of the participants uh, in this webinar can testify to. Um, so what are the solutions? We need a change of mindsets in the world of finance. Uh, we need change of policies. We need finance ministers to actually get engaged and pay attention. And we need new finance instruments and, and tools. So this is where the Good Food Finance Network comes in, uh, an initiative that has really uh, come into being in conjunction with the whole process that led to the UN Food Systems Summit. Uh, and the vision here is to engage um, finance sector actors, both policymakers and uh, the, the financial sector itself, to shift capital flows decisively towards good food finance in support of healthy, sustainable, and just uh, outcomes for, for all. And uh, the partners in this initiative, uh, you can see here on this screen, uh, We in Eat, um, FAIR, uh, a major investment uh, initiative based in, in the UK, Food Systems for the Future, the UN Environment Program, and the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, and with an, a large number of uh, supporting partners, including the World Bank, uh, Rabobank, and the Jeff, uh, and, and others. And uh, uh, th this coalition, by the way, is, 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 is growing uh, as we speak. Now, um, uh, I want you here to pay attention to the, the, the inner uh, circle, um, the, the, uh, the core, which is 
um, to strengthen food system governance and stability. And then the four, um, uh, the, 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 the four areas in the next concentric circle, um, uh, securing equitable food systems, uh, reshape public support uh, uh, and incentives, integrate environmental, uh, environment health and social risks, and, and scale fit for purpose financial products. These are the five imperatives that uh, emerge from the Food System Summit process, the so-called finance lever. And our work in the Good Food Finance Network is, is really to um, develop uh, concrete, uh, actionable uh, uh, changes in finance, both policy and finance practice in these five areas. And uh, we are now developing an action agenda corresponding with this uh, and where we will uh, uh, challenge uh, uh, banks and insurance companies and other finance actors to make actual commitments, as well as ministries of finance to make policy commitments along these lines. And we're forming catalyst groups uh, to, to actually develop this menu of change in, in the world of finance. I think the GFFN uh, is uh, highly relevant for Africa, for the European Union, and for, for this meeting, because food finance largely bypasses Africa, unfortunately, uh, particularly private, and um, it tends to exacerbate rapidly rising global and regional risks, as I just talked about, and also uh, it bypasses significant investment opportunities, and this is a real challenge, not least in Africa. And massive policy failures cement the, the status quo um, in terms of trade and subsidy policies, uh, the lack of holistic food system policies in too many countries, and lack of finance instruments tailored to innovators, entrepreneurs, uh, et cetera. Now, how do we enable and empower change from the ground up? Now I'm turning to the other initiative. Um, uh, we know that there are lots of people with brilliant and game-changing ideas, but they lack voice, they lack visibility, they lack uh, support, and of course they lack uh, financing. So uh, this is where the Food System Game Changers Lab comes in. It's a multi-phase program in support of uh, the outcomes of the Food System Summit, uh, Rockefeller Foundation, Thought for Food, Eat, um, IDEO and others are, are the partners behind it. And we've gone through an open call and evaluation process. Uh, and through that, built 24 solution cohorts composed of 412 solutions from all over the world, 83 countries, including many in, in Africa. And these solution cohorts really bring together the people with the ideas to tackle specific challenges. And um, uh, this has now enabled uh, the innovators to, to actually develop together truly game-changing uh, solutions. And now through a matchmaking program, a process that's ongoing with governments, funders, companies, investors, and others, the idea is to connect these uh, cohorts to the people and uh, organizations with the power to turn them into uh, reality. And uh, 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 there's no time here to go into each and every cohort, but uh, just a quick scan here, you get a sense of the richness of the, uh, these cohorts and, and what the, uh, these uh, individuals and entities around the world have actually been able to build in the Food System Game Changers Lab. And as I say, many of them are based in Africa. Uh, the way forward is that uh, we want um, to continue this engagement and we invite all of you to, uh, to check this out. Uh, visit the Food System Game Changers Lab online and see how can this be helpful to you. Um, and uh, we will develop a range of offerings, including uh, uh, collaboration with Cambridge University to run um, uh, policy boot camps uh, to connect the solutions to problems and challenges that governments national and local governments actually want to, to solve. Um, now, uh, what's the relevance here for Africa and for this meet, for European Union and this meeting? Well, uh, uh, the Game Changers Lab connects African food system innovators to each other, to peers around the world, and to scaling partners. 
And going forward, uh, we would be very interested to uh, uh, use the lab to incubate food system solutions of mutual interest to African and European policymakers, funders, companies, and other constituencies. And we believe that also the Game Change Lab can serve as a model and inspiration for similar initiatives in Africa or between Europe and Africa. And finally, uh, there, we believe there's a big opportunity in combining thinking about financial and food system innovation, because we need game-changing solutions for transforming food production and consumption. It needs to get really started and be scaled during this decade. That's what the science is telling us loud and clear. It really is code red for humanity, as the UN Secretary General has said, when it comes to climate change. But it's true also for nature, and it's true when it comes to public health. And we need financial entities to see these solutions and the people behind them and their potential. Financial entities need to realize what an opportunity there is in terms of investing in these solutions. And we need financial instruments that can enable investment at scale in these solutions because too many instruments are not suited to really support scaled up, um, uh, scale up action uh, when it comes to uh, the kind of agriculture we need to see, the kind of food systems we need to see. And we need governments to put in place enabling policies. Uh, and here, it's really important that finance ministers wake up and smell the flowers and realize that uh, what happens in the food systems is of enormous importance to, nation, to, the, to the economies of entire nations. Um, so with that, uh, I hope you've gotten a sense of what these initiatives are about and that you're inspired to figure out uh, how you could uh, um, play a role. And um, with that, back to you, uh, Norha. Uh, thank you so much, Olaf, for this very uh, interesting and informative presentation and for presenting the, the initiatives uh, you did. And I think the link is also shared in the chat box for more information. Again, please use the Q&A uh, tab for questions. We will have a final discussion at the end. Um, and now we can move to our uh, next speaker. Just give me one second to share my screen. So now we move on to our next presentation on supporting young African agripreneurs. We have Nono Sekoto, Sector Lead at AL4 Agribusiness Network, the African Leadership Academy. Uh, she's a commercial farmer and entrepreneur and an award-winning youth and agriculture advocate. She's working in South Africa and the region. Uh, she's working in agriculture and this leveraged her eight years background in financial services, 10 year commercial mixed farming experience and a global network of agriculture stakeholders built over the years. As a former member of the National Executive Council for African Farmers Association, she established uh, AFASA, Youth Engaging Youth Farmers in South Africa. She is also a member of the Women Committees at the World Farmers Organization, and she sits on the Board of Agricultural Development Agency in South Africa. She founded Growth Shoot, managing a 2000 um, Hectare Farm with mixed production and advanced AG consulting to corporates to connect South African young farmers uh, to available opportunities. She's currently the lead uh, at the AL for Agribusiness Network at the African Leadership Academy, where she connects youth and agriculture to opportunities across Africa in partnership with industry stakeholders. Uh, she's an um, alumni at uh, Oklahoma State University, Entrepreneurs Fellow, the Goldman Sachs Entrepreneurship. Uh, 10,000 Women Program, African Management Institute, the University of Pretoria, and Frankfurt School of Finance and Management. So, no, no, the floor is yours, please. Great. Thank you, Nohan. I'm really excited uh, for this opportunity. Let me quickly um, share my screen and then I will start. 
So as mentioned, um, just a brief, back, brief background around why it is I am in this position that I find myself in, which is really finding ways to support young people in the sector. And the way my career has developed has really allowed me to understand what are the key things we need to target to be able to actually make this happen successfully. And I believe the work we're doing um, as I'm growing in the sector is really helping me to understand and communicate that to various stakeholders. So given you, um, I mean, you saw I've got quite a range of opportunities, but I'd like to focus on the work I'm doing with African Leadership Academy at the moment. Um, African Leadership Academy really aims to develop the next future leaders across the continent. And I think the most key thing about it is around how we're identifying the right potential, uh, developing them to a certain level, developing them to a certain level, and then connecting them to opportunities to be able to actually make things happen, um, especially because we need to make sure that they are uh, facing uh, and addressing Africa's grandest challenges that we all know about. And so the academy really um, focuses on, on developing the young people here in South Africa. And then what's very special about the work we do is the team that is the networks team, which is where I'm part of, we have a lifelong engagement with all the young leaders that leave um, um, our school when they go into the world. And so my um, um, excitement was when I was called to come and actually lead the network that focuses on supporting young leaders to get into agriculture. And so in 2020, 2020 I established um, the AL for Agribusiness Network, which really is um, you know, making sure that we're identifying these isolated youth who are interested in agribusinesses and agriculture and giving them access to various opportunities. And our main aim is to really find ways to uh, uh, create a vibrant network of young leaders working together to innovate and transform Africa's agriculture. A brief, brief background around this program and how we have developed it. We really needed to understand what are the problems that we have identified in, in, in agriculture. And as we know, um, um, uh, um, uh, agri, agri businesses and agriculture is very important, especially rural livelihoods in the sector, food security, um, youth unemployment being huge issues that we need to tackle, as well as making sure that those operating in uh, agri businesses will be successful. And obviously, the, the, the making sure that this sector is successful will obviously um, uh, um, a catapult into a variety of opportunities across our economies. But the challenge we then realized is that our young people face very specific challenges uh, right now, as we know, you know, feeling isolated in this uh, careers, sometimes even understanding how agriculture is quite a stigma at the moment, you know, it seems like it's, it's all about poverty and struggle, and then obviously accessing uh, opportunities that will enable them to succeed in the sector is also a critical uh, challenge that we would like to over overcome. And so to give you a brief background of our net network and why we believe that what we need to do as we're transforming the sector is to also make the, the sector attractive enough for young people to, to come into the sector. And the only way we believe we can do that is by showcasing successful um, youth uh, who are participating and excited and are actually uh, finding those opportunities in the sector. And to give you um, some ideas around who our network members are, so they, 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 they consist of future leaders who are young people studying agribusinesses across the continent. They're looking for you know, internship opportunities as well as development um, in career development and understanding how to build their careers. And we also have um, we're professional, young professionals working in, uh, across the continent in agribusinesses, also trying to uh, develop themselves. And then what we find in our sector, which is very exciting, is young people who are taking up the challenges to start their own businesses and run agribusinesses. And so we're trying to find ways also to make sure that they are well supported. This gives you a brief, um, um, you know, network, our network in numbers. Currently, we've got just about 400 young leaders um, at various levels. 
Um, our partners, we've got all sorts of partners across the continent. We've got some off the continent as well, but the majority of them obviously exist on the continent. And we also are finding um, um, industry leaders who are interested to also come through and share experiences around building careers, as well as exposing those opportunities um, um, to young people to make them understand how to build their career paths in the sector. What's also been uh, great is we're supported by a board, which uh, allows us to really understand how else to open up those opportunities. And we make sure that um, our board is consisting of our partners, as well as uh, young leaders and various stakeholders interested in our work. And what has been exciting is that the, we are now actually identifying uh, specific funders who are really keen in making sure that we're supporting this whole concept of networks. I think for us, that's actually something so exciting with Small Foundation, where we're able to actually um, show the importance of why people need to really form those strong bonds and networks and, and, and collaborations to be able to achieve um, all these grand challenges that we've faced. And I'll also share a little bit about how we brought Standard Bank as a, 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 a sponsor partnership in one of our programs. And so out of the many challenges that I've, uh, you know, that I've, I've kind of indicated, the one I'm going to speak to you about today is around the challenges where we're now trying to help our young leaders to be to participate in the sector. So with this, this scenario, it gives you an idea where our students are looking for work experience. As you know, um, it's very hard to you know, find a job without experience. Then we have our young leaders who are professionals. They already are employed, but really needing to understand how do they further develop and how do they actually explore the sector. And then the other challenge is our young leaders. It, it has been very interesting to see that young people getting into the sector, especially in agribusinesses, are finding ways, um, they're finding opportunities in their community, or they're seeing that agriculture is maybe exciting. But we know that there's a lot of young people starting businesses in the agri sector who do not have agri specific skills. And so when they try to develop these businesses of theirs, they're not able to get the right skills because it's quite costly. And so we realized, especially me being a, you know, an entrepreneur myself, I come from the finance world. And so I've had to build partners who can obviously provide um, other types of um, um, uh, skills in my business. But as we mentioned, uh, and entrepreneurs are looking to access affordable technical skills in their businesses. So with this challenge, this is what we've come up with. Our solution was that we already have a, an internship program in our, um, in our community, but we needed to make sure that our agribusinesses, and this is not just agribusinesses in our network, we're actually now reaching out to young entrepreneurs across the continent who actually need uh, those skills. And we have connected them with our um, agribusiness internship program. And that allows us to actually get our um, network members who are students looking for these opportunities and we connect them to these entrepreneurs. I mean, this provides uh, the entrepreneurs affordable skills, which we actually cater for. And, um, and then obviously the, the, the students um, um, get work experience and exposure to what's happening on the ground and really understand how these young people are building businesses. And then it also provides us a way to connect young professionals um, for exposure as well and realize what other opportunities are available. We've also done so about um, uh, put together what we call the agribusiness think tank webinar. And this is a way for us to really gather the community uh, of these entrepreneurs and these students and put them together and really get them on this platform that allows them to connect and exchange ideas and share experiences around where they are. And, and, and also this provides an opportunity for the agribusinesses to think around um, what solutions are possible, et cetera. And, and we've found that this has been quite an exciting um, uh, uh, program over the last uh, year since we've started it. But another part that has been exciting was obviously now to find the right partners to assist us. As I mentioned, we have entrepreneurs that are actually not um, that are outside our network, and obviously now they are part of our networks, and they're through our partners. Um, we've got Nourishing Africa, uh, SAB Foundation, and Anzisha Prize, which is a, a division of African Leadership Academy. 
And what's exciting about what's happening there is these are uh, uh, partners that are looking after a variety of uh, entrepreneurs. And a lot of them are young people in agribusinesses. And so we have now access to a range. I mean, this is quite a big cohort of young people that are building businesses that we can find ways to connect with and actually provide them access to, um, um, to, to these internship programs that we are putting together. And so we've also then decided to put a little bit of an intervention where we help them to understand how do they bring skills into their businesses and make the most of the opportunity that they have once this person is actually in their business. And so our training courses that we've put together has been really exciting for the entrepreneurs to make the most of this opportunity. And then we then got Standard Bank, who uh, was very interested in supporting this when it was a pilot. It's, uh, we just completed our pilot. And they, were, uh, um, they came on board as the funder to this program. Their uh, need, which was very important for us to actually address, is that they have a need to support uh, entrepreneurs. And so having focused on the fact that they will be bringing uh, access to skills to entrepreneurs, they were um, uh, happy to try the sponsorship program so that we can actually pay the stipends uh, for those students who are working in those businesses. And so it has been really exciting just seeing all of this happening. And um, uh, we're very lucky that Standard Bank has given us this opportunity. And this just gives you a view of one of our think tanks uh, webinars that we took that took place. It really just um, uh, we're just displaying how many people attend the webinar. It's really, it's quite exciting. It's one of our most well attended uh, events. And, 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 and as you can see here, there's quite a lot of young women who are building businesses from across the continent. Um, and so this, as I said, we're just highlighting the women this, this, uh, this session, but we have a variety of these think tank programs that really allows uh, our network members to connect with each other and share um, some opportunities. And so for me in closing, the opportunity to develop further means we need to have more standard banks. And, and listening to um, this, the previous speakers, um, you know, when um, we're speaking about how you're making sure that you are targeting the right stakeholders and how you're engaging them so that you can bring them on board. And then obviously um, um, ensuring that finance can be appropriate to what it is that we need to do. I think it's been really exciting uh, for me to be in this, uh, um, in this session to really then show the opportunities that exist already and that we're kind of um, trying to uncover and hearing how other organizations are actually doing their work across uh, the sector. So it's very exciting. As you can see, we have a lot of entrepreneurs sitting in this, in this I mean, this is just three organizations alone. There's like uh, so many out there. And a program like this that enables uh, uh, entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs who are starting businesses to have access um, and extra uh, skills in their businesses can really go a long way in making sure that they succeed and, and, and proceed. So thank you very much. I hope that was uh, uh, relevant to what you've heard. Thank you so much, Nona, for this uh, very informative presentation. And it's uh, really good to understand what exactly you're doing with the entrepreneurs and how you're pushing forward for youth and for women as well. Um, and I think uh, now that we discussed somehow mobilizing the private sector, the entrepreneurs, the financial institutions, we can open the discussion. Please, if you have any questions, you can use the Q&A tab or you can now just raise your hand um, and we can take the questions live. Uh, just before we go on, I have one question for everyone somehow, since we're trying to create a network and a platform where all stakeholders are engaged. Uh, we're trying to have um, um, integration between same actors on a horizontal level and different actors somehow on a vertical level. I would like to know your opinion on how we can ensure the sustainability of such an initiative and the commitment of the stakeholders and organizations to uh, this R&I platform that we're trying to launch soon. So and I think Francois also has a question. 
Um, if you would like to speak up, this is, I think he has been sharing also a lot of material in the chat box. So Francois, can you hear us? Yes, uh, good morning. So my question was on the book, which was released in March by the Nigerian Ndidi Okonwo Nuneli, whether this was a book which has been used by the youth platform Ivory Business in South Africa. Um. Hi, Francois, um, thanks for the question. Um, so I haven't actually read all of the book, so I need to actually, um, you know, that's a challenge for me to actually do. But um, Didi has got some uh, great extensive, um, who's the author, she has extensive experience in, 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 in the work of developing uh, um, entrepreneurs actually in, 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 the, in the continent. And I think for me, I would believe that there are some valuable key experiences that can be picked up from that book. Um, and because I think more than anything, experience often is, is, is the best way, as you know, to, to really try things. Um, and so Didi's uh, work has been um, and at, at various levels as well, you know, um, not only in establishing platforms that uh, bring on young people and, and, and entrepreneurs into uh, the agri sector, as well as uh, uh, building a business that incorporates a lot of the, um, the entrepreneurs, you know, through the Nourishing Africa, actually, she's also part of establishing that, uh, that organization. And the other one is obviously, she's also got policy level uh, experience. And so I believe that there could be some really valuable points in there and so hopefully if uh, you know I'll take that challenge to make sure that I actually go and um, uh, get those points as myself as well yes thank you Nana so um, maybe we can also uh, move forward and ask you uh, your opinions on how do you think we can somehow align the agendas between the different stakeholders. I mean, we all know that financial institutions, they have somehow their own agendas. Entrepreneurs are a bit different, policymakers are a bit different. So from your perspective, how can we align these agendas and push forward towards not only the uh, general uh, SDGs, for example, but also we could have some regional and local benefits as well and push these agendas a bit forward. So what's, what's your opinion? Anyone can go. Okay, I've, I've got a suggestion, <laughs> that's okay. Yes. Um, I think for me, as I said, the, the most important thing about the work we're doing um, is really finding a, the, a way to communicate to various stakeholders of the opportunities that exist for them to partner with us. And so having seen um, some of the, um, you know, the, the, the opportunities that um, both the speakers have shared, I think there's definitely a way for us to be able to, to connect further, um, to be able to find those opportunities. I think it's just that opportunity to be able to sit in front of stakeholders and converse, which is something that is always not accessible to the majority of the entrepreneurs in the sector. Everything just seems so far away, even though the opportunities are there. I, I very much agree with, uh, with Nono. Um, I think there's enormous value in uh, spending that uh, precious time uh, to actually uh, sit down and see how can we make the, more, the smartest connections um, between the kinds of initiatives 
uh, that we've been hearing about today. And of course, there are others that are also relevant. And, and FAO, with its uh, enormous um, presence in the sector, uh, credibility with governments and, and with uh, business and, and the whole range of stakeholders, farmers, of course, not least, um, uh, has a crucial role to play in kind of brokering the, um, uh, the, the necessary conversations um, and, uh, and we would be delighted from our side, and I speak on behalf of all of our partners as well in the Good Food Finance Initiative and the Food and Game Changers Lab to um, really compare notes uh, with all of you uh, to, to find the best ways forward to really make a difference uh, on the ground and not least to empower farmers and empower entrepreneurs and innovators that are that have the bright ideas and given a chance could could really make an enormous difference. Um, I'd like to just come in and just thank you all up for that um, please, please, intervention please. and of course we are here to fully support um, and actually these webinars to me are a beginning of a relationship and a connection. So I think it's very important that we take that further. And uh, we stand ready to provide all the support that is needed. Uh, Nono and Olaf, thank you for your presentations. Um, it was really a, a breath of fresh air, certainly for us. Uh, I know there are many participants from across the globe, but I think we can consider ourselves to be one family. So thank you, thank you very much to all of you. Thank you all so much. I would like to also thank you all. Unfortunately, we're running out of time, but I think today, like you said, was the beginning of uh, um, a future relationship and we were really happy to have you all today. And thank you for your very interesting presentations and for sharing your initiatives with us. And we definitely, we need to move forward together. Um, like we said, uh, the Leap for FNSA project is uh, launching a platform soon. We're currently in the process of creating this platform. We're collecting ideas on what is expected from each stakeholders group. And uh, I will share with you the link in the chat box for everyone who would like to join our process and have a say on the, on the way forward. And, uh, join us in connecting different stakeholder groups and making sure that everyone um, has a say in the final platform that we're trying to connect. And please also um, stay tuned because this webinar is recorded and will be uploaded soon on our uh, official website and YouTube channel. And um, please also join us for the upcoming events. Subscribe to our newsletter to get everything um, new and exciting about the Leap for FNSSA project. I would like to thank you all for joining us today. And I'm really looking forward to future engagements together. Thank you all the speakers and thank you all the attendees for joining us today. Have a nice day. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you.